Now here in the book of Acts, in chapter number 7, this, is, this entire chapter is, is just basically like one big preaching, one big sermon by, by Stephen. This is, in, in, in chapter 6 we saw where they just, they couldn't, they couldn't answer him, he had too much wisdom, and they just arrested him. They didn't like what Stephen was doing. Stephen was a man, he did a lot of miracles, and... Um, you know, he did a lot of great things. When they weren't able to, to argue with them, basically they just they hired men to lie about him. And this is where we are in chapter 7. They, they lied about him, they arrested him, and they're accusing him, saying he came to change the law and, and basically not to follow Moses and just to change everything that we believe. And um, so they, they, they get him together here, and they basically just ask him, say, hey, are these things so? Look, they're, they're saying these things about you. Basically, what do you have to say? And... We're gonna, there's, the way that we're going to go through this, I'm not going to go through this, it's a really long chapter, and I'm going to go through it verse by verse. We read the entire thing. Um, uh, we're gonna, first, I'm going to kind of give an, an overview of the entire chapter and, and the, the primary, like what, it's, what he's saying, what he's teaching, and basically it's kind of going over what is actually happening here. And then I'm going to go back and hit some, some key verses that we could learn maybe a little bit extra, and there's, there's some extra truths in there, but we could turn to some extra scripture to kind of to see what's going on here. But... Um, Let's start off with, with this big overview. So basically, you have, you've got Stephen, and he's starting to preach a sermon. And you notice, he goes all the way back to Abraham. And he starts, he starts talking to him. And mind you, he's talking to, to the chief priests. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to people who are educated in the religion, right? I mean, they know about Abraham. They know about Moses. They claim to believe in Moses. So he goes back, and he's saying, okay... I'm going to go all the way back to Abraham, and he's going to, he's basically, he's like repeating all these, the, the highlights, these big stories of the Bible, starting with Abraham, and then going, you know, and talking about Joseph a little bit, and talking about, um, you know, Moses, he spends a lot of time on Moses, and what happened in Egypt, and um, we're going to, we're going to kind of go over this a little bit, the way he starts off, and you wonder, like, why did, why did he do this, why did he go all the way back to Abraham, he's making a really good point, and We'll get, it, we'll get into that right now, because he gets, he gets a lot of stuff, like he's, he's leading him down a path, and he's showing him things, and he's proving from the Old Testament, from the Scripture, basically, that, that Jesus was Christ, and he, he kind of he gives them this history, because it starts off, you notice, they're comfortable with it. They don't stop him. They allow him to speak for a long time. I mean, this is his words. He's talking, and he's saying all these things, and they're like, yeah, 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 you know, they get it. But then it's not until, like, near the end where it really starts just pushing their buttons and, and they really get upset with them to the point where they don't even want to listen to them anymore. So, the first verse we're going to start looking at here is look at verse number 5. It says, he's talking about Abraham, you know, he, he, he was told to leave his land and God promised him this land for inheritance. In verse 5 it says, and he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. So, this is the first place here we see in this chapter where, um, you know, he's, he's talking about Abraham. And again, we see that, it, you know, salvation comes as a promise. And he's, and he's showing them here with his words. He's saying that, you know, Abraham was given this land by promise even before he even had a child. Because God promised that that, that land was going to be an inheritance to Abraham for him and his first children forever, right? To him and to his seed forever. And um, he didn't even have a son. He didn't even have a child yet. So Abraham believed on that promise. He believed God. He trusted in God that God, what God was saying was true. And that's the same way that, that obviously that we get saved today. I mean, God's made us a promise. He's given us a promise of an eternal inheritance, right? I mean, Abraham, this was an eternal inheritance promised to him. We have an eternal inheritance in heaven. We have a promise of eternal life. And that is what we need, obviously, to believe in order to be saved. And so I love how he starts off just talking about Abraham, and he throws that in there about the, about the promise and believing. Now, he's not necessarily just coming straight out and saying it, but he's using, he's going through all these stories, and he brings up specific points in each of these stories that, that are pointing to salvation and pointing to Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 6, continuing on here, it says, because Stephen brings up some prophecy, it says in verse 6, And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage, and entreat them evil four hundred years. 
And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. Obviously, he's talking to people that already know this and know this has happened. But he's bringing up the fact that, hey, God said this back then, right? And um, all of these things did come to pass. Everything that God said came true. But he's telling the story, look, you know, um, God told this to Abraham that his seed was going to go into bondage. They were going to be in bondage for 400 years. And then they were going to be taken out. And that God was going to judge the oppressors that were oppressing his seed and his children. And that's exactly what happened. That came to pass. That was a prophecy given in Scripture in the Old Testament given to Abraham that came through. And now these people in this day, in, 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 you know, in a day of this time, can look back and say, yeah, that's true. That's exactly what happened. And um, continuing on here, so it's, he explains here in verse 8 that he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And he goes and he explains that first covenant a little bit, saying that, okay, you know, Abraham, Abraham began Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. And he starts off, because Abraham is the, is the first time where there's a covenant made in that sense um, with man. I mean, God brought salvation to Adam when Adam and Eve, and when they sinned, and... Um, you know, there was a beginning of the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ to come when he slain uh, the, the animal. They were, they were wrapped in the skins because a, an animal sacrifice had been made. And, you know, the blood of an animal had been shed as a, as a picture of Jesus Christ coming to save them. And then um, here in, in, with Abraham, he gave him this, the, the promise of circumcision. It was another covenant, right? It was like a fleshly covenant that was supposed to be something to show... Um, no separation, I'm not getting into circumcision. And then he goes into the laws of Moses. And um, I'm going to skip over a lot of this because he kind of just, just talks about a lot of events that just happened. But here, look at verse number 25 because we get a little bit of insight. A lot of times when you read the Old Testament and you read one like Moses killed the Egyptian, you don't necessarily understand why he did it. You know, I remember reading it and it's just like, you know, there's the, the two men were striving together. They're the... Um, Moses saw that one of his brethren was, was being wronged by an Egyptian, basically, and he killed the Egyptian. But in verse number 25 here in Acts chapter 7, it explains why he did that. It says, for he supposed his brethren, well, it's at verse 24, it says, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. So, now, what Moses did here, I think he went about doing it the wrong way, killing a man. I mean, he shouldn't have killed him, because it says he avenged him. Now, we're taught that God is, God is the revenger, right? We're not to take matters in our own hands. We're supposed to just trust in the Lord. God will avenge us. God will take care of those things. God will recompense. The Bible says, you know, I will recompense, saith the Lord. I will repay. God's the one of judgment. He'll make sure that, the, that, that wrongs are made right. Um, Moses knew that he was going to be called God. He, he wanted to deliver his people out of the oppression. He wanted to help them out. He went about it the wrong way here, but he said, I mean, the reason why he did it, he was thinking that, look, maybe this, by doing this act, by killing this man, they're going to see and rally behind him and say, here's someone that can help us. Here's someone that can save us. Here's someone that can free us from this oppression that could deliver them. He says, but they understood not that that's, that's what he was doing. So what happens? Of course, he, um, he flees. You know, when the next day he finds two brethren, two, you know, two of their own people, two, uh, two Jews were, were fighting together, and he tries to make them peace. And say, hey, look, you know, you guys shouldn't be fighting. And they're like, oh, what, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? So that scared him because he thought that he got away with it. He thought that no one knew what he did, basically, or, or, um, and that the people that did know weren't going to, you know, write him out. And um, he got scared at that, and he fled. And he kind of explains that in here, too. He explains how he had a couple sons. But, um, you know, moving on here, we see he keeps on, um, he keeps on preaching. So, <clears throat> he's laying a foundation with Abraham and mentioning that you need to, you know, he believed the promise. And then he goes to Moses saying that he thought, Moses thought that they were going to understand, that the people were going to understand, that God was going to deliver them by his hand. But they didn't understand this. And then Stephen, you know, he goes on a little bit, and then he really starts to make his point and just, just really drive it home. Look at verse number 35. It says, um, This Moses whom they refused, saying, Who may be a ruler and a judge? 
The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. Now he starts making the point that, look, the people back then were talking to Moses and saying, who made you a ruler? Who made you a judge? And this is God's people, right? Saying, who, who do you think you are? Who, you're not a ruler. You're not a judge over us. Who do you think you are? And he said, well, that's saying, Moses, God made him to be a ruler. God made him to be a judge. God's the one that appointed him to be the ruler. So yes, he was to be a ruler. Yes, he was to be a judge. And God made that. But the people at the time were thinking, you know, who are you? And I believe, you know, the reason why he's doing that is because now he's going to start emphasizing that they're doing the exact same thing that the people did back then to Moses. See, it's, it's, it's ironic because now these people are saying, oh, we believe in Moses. We believe in Moses. Moses was a great man of God. Yet they're doing the same exact thing that the people back then did to Moses. They did the same exact thing to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to be, you know, as a ruler, as the Messiah, as the Christ. By God, he was, he was sent to do that, and they, and they rejected him, and they were just basically like, who do, you, who do you think you are? And he starts getting into this, and this is where we're going to start seeing their, a little bit of their anger. Um, we're in verse 35. Let's continue on here in verse 36. It says, He brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. And he's, he's you know, again, still talking about Moses here. And he's starting to tie in the, you know, the wonders and the signs that Moses did, which is exactly relevant with what Jesus Christ did. I mean, Jesus Christ did amazing miracles and wonders and signs. You know, he did all these things and, and they couldn't even dispute it. They couldn't refute it. Stephen himself was doing wonders and signs. And they couldn't argue with him. But they still hated him. But he's, he's bringing out this point. See, he goes into this whole history because this is what they claim to believe in. So he's taking what they claim to believe in to show them, like, look, you don't even believe in this, what you're claiming to believe in. And he's showing them from Scripture. And what's great is that he's proving it because over and over again, he, he, he brings up Old Testament Scripture and he's quoting it to them. And he's saying, look, this is what happened. Moses did this. God said this. You know, God made him. And this is all coming from the Old Testament. And he's proving to them. And, and just kind of in, in a, I don't want to say a subtle way, but, he, but he's just, it's, it's really a not so subtle way. He's kind of pointing out their own hypocrisy and their own sin. Now, I love this in verse 37, because now he's saying, let's read verse 37. It says, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, Prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. These are the words that, that Moses spake in the Old Testament. This is another quote from the Old Testament. And he basically what he's saying is that, oh, by the way, you know that guy that you claim to believe in? That guy Moses? The guy who you say, you know, we're obeying Moses' law and we're doing this and, and we believe in Moses. You know, as for Christ, we don't know anything about him, but we believe in Moses. He's the same guy that prophesied about the coming of Jesus Christ, yet they still denied him. You claim to believe in Moses, and Moses prophesied right here, said, Prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear. But they didn't want to hear him. The same way they didn't want to hear Moses. It says in verse 38, This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel. We'll get to that a little bit later. Verse um, 39, To whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts, turn back again into Egypt. So they're saying, look, the fathers, they didn't want to have anything to do with them, but in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. And verse 40 says, saying unto Aaron, make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. So their hearts go back to Egypt. Now in Egypt, they had a lot of false gods. There were idols. They had all these, you know, the sun gods and everything else that they worshipped, basically Baal, the devil. That's what they worshipped in the land of Egypt. And their fathers, who Moses saved, Moses brought them out, Moses did all these miracles, he showed them all these great things, right? They said, who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? He still, you know, got them out of the, out of the persecution, out of the, out of the land of Egypt. Moses is gone for not even 40 days, and, and they're just saying, well, we don't know what happened to Moses. Make us gods. In their heart, they're already turning back into Egypt, which God just delivered them out of that bondage. And they're going back into it. And that's why they ask for the for the you know for Aaron to just make him a god. Because that's what they knew in Egypt, and that's where their heart's going back into. And it says in verse 41, and they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifices unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. 
Now, every false religion in the world rejoices in the works of their own hands. Every false religion believes in a works-based salvation. That is the one thing that separates true Bible-believing Christians from the rest of the world, is, is the belief that you are truly only saved by faith, and it's not of works. Any other religion, or any other religion I've ever heard of or known about at all, every single one relies on you basically being a good person, doing the right things, obeying some kind of commandments, you know, doing more good than bad, what have you, whatever, whatever it is, in one sense or another, it's all the works of your own hands. It's all just pleasure and, 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 and you know, esteeming the works of your own hands to be something when the Bible is saying exactly the opposite, that it's by faith. And um, this is real interesting here too because what we see here is when they do this, what are they doing? They're going... They're asking for a, a graven image. They're asking for an idol. They're asking for a God. Right? Their faith is not in the, in the Lord, in the God that just saved them, and they witnessed the plagues and everything else, and they're just like, well, you know, make us some gods. We don't know what happened to Moses. As if they were making Moses their God. Right? Moses was just the messenger, but they didn't want him to be a messenger. So they made a calf. Now, think about the correlation between this and Romans chapter 1. Because this is the downward spot. This is, this is the reasoning that, that God gives people up. In Romans chapter 1, verse 23, the Bible says, And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And what they do, they made an image. They made a golden idol of a calf, which is a four-footed you know, four beast. And then it says, Wherefore, in Romans 1, 24, so because of this, because they made an image, because they changed the glory of, of the uncorruptible God into an image, it says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So it says, look, they did this, they changed, they made this idol, they worship, you know, worshiping these false idols and were looking to them. God gave them up. Look at um, Acts 7. Verse 41 says, And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Verse 42, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness. So here we see it, it, it correlates perfectly with Romans chapter 1. Again, the same terminology, God gave them up. He said, God gave them up to worship the whole host of heaven. He says, fine, you're going to worship that idol? I'm going to, we're going to, I'm going to give you up to worship the whole of heaven. And God, get, God got angry with them, if you remember. I mean, they, were, they didn't even come into the promised land. And I think one of the major reasons is because of this, because they, they turned to idols. They, they turned to just a false god. They didn't believe in the first place. They didn't want Moses. They didn't want to hear it. God still physically saved them out of the land of Egypt. But they didn't go into the promised land. Why? Because they didn't believe. And Hebrews chapter 3 describes exactly that and explains that. Hebrews 3.16 says, For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So even Hebrews chapter 3 is saying, look, they didn't enter into his rest. They didn't enter into the promised land. Um, again, there's so many uh, illustrations in that story of the Old Testament. And in, all, in a lot of these stories, the Old Testament provides a lot of truth and meaning behind what actually happens. I mean, you get, you get the, the reality of it. I mean, these events actually took place. They actually happened. But then you can look at it a little bit deeper and learn some truths about about you know, the symbols and the, and the things that these stories actually mean that can still apply today. And here he's talking to, Stephen's talking to this group of people, which many of them, if not most of them, are reprobate. They, don't, they didn't believe on Jesus Christ. They saw the miracles. They saw everything happening, but they rejected him. And now he's bringing up this story that, about Moses leading the, the children of Israel, and they didn't believe. And they didn't get, weren't allowed to enter into the promised land because of their unbelief. Stephen even said that you know God gave them up to, to worship the whole host of heaven. 
And, um, you know, all these stories are written for our admonition, and it's not a, it's not a coincidence that the, that the Bible uses the same exact terminology, then God turned and gave them up to worship the whole host of heaven when they made this idol, when they made the sacrifice, when they, when they completely just turned from God and just said, I mean, it it's, amazes me every single time I think about it. How can you see and witness all of those things, all of the miracles, all of the plagues, you know, God in a, in a fire by night and in a cloud by day. And you can see the, the, the sea, the, the Red Sea parted. I mean, you see the whole thing just standing up on its end and you can walk through on dry ground. And then the enemies, the people who are trying to take your life are killed. And, and you have the man that's leading the way and teaching you and telling you about God. Tell, just I mean, you couldn't make it more obvious. What's the right thing? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's this guy Moses who's being used by God and, and, and performing all of these wonderful miracles. Maybe that's the right way, but they're still just, they've hardened their heart, they've hardened their neck, and they just turned to just some dumb idol, the, the works of their own hands, because that's what they cared about more than, than the real God. And they harden their heart, and God gives them up. And it's the same problem that these Pharisees have, that these chief priests had. They harden their heart. They, they, they love their own, the works of their own hands, and they love their work salvation, and that's what they're sticking to. And nothing that they see or hear is going to change that. And God's not going to let them enter into his rest either. Continue on here. Let's look at um, verse number 43. He continues, he says, Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. And I don't want to get into this too much, but you know, you, you see these people that have the, you know, they call it the Star of David, right? And it's this, it's this Jewish thing where you see a lot of people, they may have these little gold emblems and stuff, and it's the, uh, the six-pointed star. It's basically like two triangles, one and then the other one's upside down, and it makes a six-pointed star. And they try to say, oh, this is the Star of David, this is the Star of David. It's not. The Bible never records anything about you know, this symbol of having a star to represent David or represent David's house or Solomon or any of that stuff. What it does talk about, though, is the star of their god, Remphan. And I believe firmly that this, that's exact, that symbol that you see today that the, that the Jews use and that the Zionists use the, that, that worship the Jews and that you know, the, to just praise Israel and... Um, this this star is not it's not a righteous thing it's not a good thing it's a star of their god Remphan and the, you know another reason why I believe that is because I mean the Jews of today they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ they're still following probably the same exact religion that these that the chief priests and the Pharisees that they followed that didn't accept Jesus Christ and it's the you know they've taken up the star of their god Remphan again I don't want to get too much into that but this is like one of the only places, if not the only place, that this is even mentioned in the Bible. So I wanted to make a note of it that when you see that, that, that emblem that's called the Star of David, that's not the Star of David. That's the, that's the Star of their God, Remphan. And um, now this is where we've gotten to the point here, just after we're in verse 43. We'll continue reading from verse 44, but then he really starts to let loose and just, just call out these. You know, up to this point, he's been pretty tame. He's been throwing in these points Throwing it about Abraham, throwing it about Moses, and, and saying how you know the people, the, the fathers of or the their fathers in Moses' day rejected Moses. Even though God made him a ruler and a judge, they rejected him, even though he did these miracles, didn't let him get into the promised land. See, a lot of this stuff though, is, it's still just just history, but now he's he's really gonna turn up the, the heat a little bit on him. And we're going to continue reading here in verse 44. It says, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the, in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Um, and he goes on and on, talking about building the, the, you know, with Solomon, verse 47, built him in house. Howbeit the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Now here I think he's saying this because they had this weird, I don't, this weird um, love for the temple. Like, when Jesus said, you know, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll build it again. And, like, they kept on taking issue with that. Like, they had this strange love for the temple that, like, it was a special thing, right? That they looked at the, at the temple as if it was, it was more holy than, than, you know, obeying God. Or that it was, it was some special place that, 
you know, what? How can you say destroy this temple? You know, like that the temple would be destroyed or something like that. They, they had a real reverence for this temple that wasn't right. And, and I'm, you know, it's, I'm struggling to find the words to explain, but over and over again, you see, like, that, that was one of the reasons, one of the accusations they brought up against Jesus Christ was that he said, you know, destroy this temple, even though he's talking about his own body. They brought that up that, um, oh, you know, our fathers, it took, you know, this long to build the temple. You're going to rebuild it in three days? Like, like, that was an accusation against them. Like, it would be illegal or wrong to even say something like that, even if he meant physically the temple. Like, wh like what's he, what law is he breaking? He's not breaking any God's laws, that's for sure. So they had this... this you know, in their hearts, they had this this bizarre um, love for that temple, the physical temple, and um, and that was like the last thing he says here before it really turns it up. And and you know, I'm sure they didn't want to hear that. That it's not about the temple is basically what he's saying. God doesn't need a temple. God doesn't need a house. God's greater than all these things. Look at verse number 51. It says, "Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart." And ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. So he's done now, basically, giving the history lesson. He's done going over all of the, the points of the Old Testament here with, with Abraham and with um, Moses. And now he's just calling out and saying, look, you're stiff-necked. Your heart is uncircumcised. You always resist the Holy Ghost. He said, as your fathers did, so you're exactly the same. We were just talking about how the fathers did the same thing to Moses. You're doing the same exact thing right now. It says, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. So now Stephen's doing the same thing that Peter's been doing in all the, in all the chapters leading up to this, saying, look, you murdered the Lord Jesus Christ. You murdered the just one. You betrayed him who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. He said, look, you have received God's word. You received the law. The angels have brought it to you. It's a miraculous thing, and you haven't even kept it. And that says in verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. So that, those words that he just said there, that got to him. That, that went straight to their heart. And you know what? God's word is powerful, to, even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. God's word, I mean, he's preaching. This is all in the Bible. He's preaching God's word to them for a long time. And it finally just cuts them. It cuts them right to the heart to where they, they, just, they can't even stand what he, that, he, that he just said that. And, you know, he called them the murderers of a just one and said they're exactly like their fathers. And they knew that, that the men back then were wicked, that were rejecting Moses. And they would say, oh, yeah, if we lived in the days of Moses, you know, we wouldn't have done those things like the fathers did. But they're exactly the same thing. They're just hypocrites. They would have been exactly the same way. They would have rejected Moses the same way they rejected Jesus Christ. And they didn't like that being pointed out. And Stephen wasn't afraid to point it out either. He knew this. He wasn't just trying to, to you know, be nice and, and bring them in. No, he's, he was telling them exactly the way it is. He was telling them the truth. And they couldn't hear it, so it says that they, they gnashed on him with their teeth. And what that means, basically, they started like yelling at him and just, just saying all kinds of things against him. They're just really angrily you know, yelling at him. And then in verse uh, 55 it says, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So he's... You know, they're gnashing on him with his teeth. He looks up and he sees like, man, like he sees God. He sees Jesus on the right hand. And he starts telling them like, I see, you know, I see God. He said, behold, I see the heavens open and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. Like, like right now, he's like, I see Jesus Christ standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice. And that was just too much for them. I mean, they are already at the point where they're just enraged with them. They are cut to the heart. Now they're just like, this is it. They could not stand to hear anymore. It says, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Just like a little child, a little spoiled bratty child, right? That is, ah, la, 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 I can't hear you, I can't hear you, I can't hear what you're saying. That's what they were doing. They were just, just, they couldn't stand to hear one more word. And they had such rage and such hatred in their heart. For, for the word of God and for what he was saying, 
that they just they didn't they couldn't stand to hear another word and they just killed them. And they picked up stones and they stoned them with stones. It says in uh, in verse fifty eight and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes on a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. They couldn't take it. I mean, at first, it started off with them just trying to get people to lie about him and arresting him. And it ended up at the point here that they, they couldn't take it anymore. They were filled with rage. And they couldn't take the truth of God's word. Now, um, so this, I mean, this is basically an overview of, of basically what happens in the entire chapter. But this is also the first introduction now that we see of Saul. And Saul later on is going to be named, renamed Paul. He's the Apostle Paul. But here in verse 58, you know, after they stoned, after they, they murdered Jesus, I mean, they did murder Jesus, but then after they murdered Stephen, right, he was innocent. He did nothing wrong, okay? And they just couldn't stand the words that were coming out of his mouth, just like Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus did nothing wrong, but they couldn't stand what he was saying, so they murdered him. Well, this, you know, this mob that, that murdered Stephen, they had to cover it up. So they brought, it says here that the, the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet. Because, I mean, they were, I'm sure they were full of blood, right? I mean, these people, they're like, okay, here's our clothes, you know, nothing happened. You know, and Saul's like, yeah, give me this stuff, I'll take care of that for you. And um, this is our first introduction to the Apostle Paul. Um, here when he was Saul and he was still, you know, going about and persecuting the church and stuff. He witnessed this event. Now, Stephen was a very great man of God, right? We said before, he did a lot of miracles. He had a lot of wisdom. They weren't able to resist his wisdom. He had the Holy Ghost. He had, you know, the power of God upon him. He was doing all kinds of great things and living a great life for God. I mean, we see nothing negative about Stephen in the Bible at all. Nothing. I mean, of course, he was a sinner, but like, I mean, he was doing great things for God. And God was using him greatly. So it might seem a little bit odd to say, well, why would God allow him to be martyred? Right? I mean, he still probably could have done all kinds of things for the glory of God. And, you know, he was doing what was right, yet something bad happened to him. I mean, he was killed. God didn't, God didn't save him from that. And we got to remember, the reason why God doesn't save him is because it was his will. Now, we don't always understand what God's will is. There's a bigger picture to be had. There's a lot more things going on than we can understand. Now, Stephen was doing, he couldn't have been doing anything better. And it was the best thing for him to be able to give his life at that moment for Jesus Christ. Because it was in God's will. He was preaching God. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing. Not worried about his own neck. And just preaching the truth unto death. He wasn't afraid of death, and we shouldn't be afraid of it either. This is the type of faith that he had. Now, we can have a little bit, maybe a better understanding of what, of what was going on here and why God allowed this to happen when you realize that Saul was there and Saul witnessed this happen. I mean, that must have been, even though he didn't get converted right away, I mean, when he saw this happen, that's got to have an impact on, on a person. I mean, you know, cut, he was... Say, speaking words that was cut to the heart. Saul was there and he witnessed this. And it had a huge impact on his life. Maybe if this hadn't happened the way it happened, if Saul wasn't there, to see you know, Stephen just, just ready to give up his entire life and lay down his life for this belief in Christ and, and, and the way he laid out the scripture and everything, maybe the Apostle Paul wouldn't have become the Apostle Paul. I mean, maybe he wouldn't have believed if he didn't if he didn't witness this and see this. Now, I mean, think of all the great things that the Apostle Paul, he's one of the, in my opinion, one of the greatest Christians to ever live. I mean, he did so many things. I mean, he's got all these books of the Bible that he was used to pen down and, and had lived a, a long life of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles and did all kinds of great things. And maybe that maybe that's at least one of the reasons why God was using Stephen to be martyred at that point to produce an Apostle Paul. I don't know, but those are the things that we don't necessarily always understand, but you know that if you're in God's will, first of all, God could protect you from everything, just like he protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace when they stood their ground, or just like he protected Daniel from the lion's den. 
I mean, he's completely able to deliver us out of any and all evil. But we don't always understand. So when you see someone, too, that, that you know, something bad happens to them, they go through trials, they go through persecutions, maybe they even get killed like this. For one, it's not necessarily because they're doing anything wrong at all. Right? You can't look at you can't look at Stephen and say, well, you know, God didn't God didn't step in and protect him. He must have been in sin. I mean, even though, yeah, he was preaching that, but he must have done something horrible. You, you can't look at him and say that at all. I mean, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. And if, if that happens to anybody, I mean, any tragedies, any bad things that happen to people that are Christians that you know, um, you can't just look at that and say, oh, it's because of sin in their life at all. It might be for some greater purpose. And we don't always understand it. It's easier to look back on your life and understand why God did some things. And you kind of see how things play out. But when it's in the middle of it, when things are happening, I mean, when, when he's just preaching to all these people, I'm sure he probably didn't expect to get stoned to death. But it happened. And a lot of people, I'm sure, grieved a lot of people that that happened. But, um, you know, God made, God had a plan and a reason for that to happen. God had a reason not to, to save him out of that particular trouble. I mean, and so many of his disciples ended up being martyred and put to death for his name. And there's a certain glory and honor in that as well. Um, and, and not, you know, and enduring unto the end and, to, and, and by keeping that, that faith and that testimony even unto death. Um, you know, it's also an opportunity to, to earn extra rewards in heaven. But... Um, yeah, it's just, it's just something to keep in mind that, that even though Stephen was so great, he was perfectly in God's will. And if that's what happens, then so be it. And maybe maybe that will happen. You know, things like that will happen in our lifetimes to us. I don't know. We know that there's a great tribulation coming. We know that Christians are going to be going and be persecuted. It might happen in our time. So just remember Stephen and his faith. And um, one of the things that's important here to know is too, and this is a little bit of a sign. We're going to start getting into to more things now. That was the whole overview of the chapter and everything that happened. But look at verse 59. Because this is, this is just one more proof of the deity of Jesus Christ. If, you ever, if, if anyone ever wants to say, oh, you know, like, you know, is Jesus God in the flesh or whatever. Verse 59 here, it says, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God. So who's he calling upon? He's calling upon God. But look at what he said. And saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So the Bible's saying here that, that when he said Lord Jesus, he was calling upon God. One more evidence, one more proof. I mean, there's so many of them in the Bible, but, but this is an interesting one. It's the Bible, because the, the author of the Bible here, um, this isn't even Stephen. Stephen's words are Lord Jesus, but the narrator is saying he called calling upon God. And of course, the narrator of the Bible is the Holy Ghost. So when the narrator says that, you know it's true. And then um, in verse 60, it says, He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now here's another interesting thing that, I, the, that stuck out to me. Uh, besides the, the, the deity of Jesus Christ here, it says, you know, Stephen had a great heart. Even though he, even while he's being stoned to death, I mean, these people hate him. They hate him with, with such hatred. I mean, they couldn't even, they were enraged. They couldn't stand to hear what he was saying. They picked up stones and started killing him, pelting him with stones. And, I mean, you'd think he'd be angry. At the very least, like, like, because it hurts. I mean, you want someone picking up rocks and throwing them at you. And people that hate you, but look at the attitude today. He said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. That is the type of, of compassion and love that he had, even at the, at the point where, I mean, anybody can understand if you would say, like, oh, man, yeah, like, you know, we go through troubles, and sometimes you could have emotion and rage, and you could have these, this anger come out over people doing you wrong and people doing something to you that they shouldn't be doing and be like, man, I, don't even, you know, I didn't even do anything wrong. Why, are they, why do they got to be doing that to me? And, and we get angry with them. But look at, I mean, Stephen was being killed. He was, he was being stoned to death, yet he still had an attitude of just, Lord, lay not this into their charge. Don't hold it against me. And um, that's the same exact attitude that Jesus Christ had. And this is, this is really interesting. In Luke 23, 34, and Luke 23, 46, the Bible records two statements 
from Jesus Christ as he was being crucified. And in all the Gospels, there's, you know, obviously you learn different things in Matthew versus Mark versus Luke versus John. And they, they, all, they all go together just fine, obviously. There's no contradictions, but they give you different insights and different pieces of information. There's two, there's two things that Jesus Christ said on the cross that's only recorded in the book of Luke. And here they are. It says, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And what did Stephen say? Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. I mean, it's almost the exact same thing. And then in verse 46 of Luke 23, it says, And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having thus said, he gave up the ghost. And Stephen said, when he called upon God, says, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And it's interesting that those are only found in the book of Luke because Luke is, the, is also the author of the book of Acts. And we see here this story of, of Stephen and all the similarities between Stephen and Jesus Christ. And just, just, it's just interesting. I mean, I don't know what else to say besides that. I was kind of pointing it out because, you know, I didn't go any deeper than that. There's nothing else to, to really say about it except that it's interesting that in, at least in Luke's mind, it must have stuck out enough that those two phrases that he recorded in the book of Luke also, um, he's recording here in the book of Acts. It's almost the same thing that Stephen said. Uh, it's not a coincidence, but it's, it's just pretty neat. And um, <clears throat> So let's go back now a little bit. We're going to go back to verse number 9. We're going to start looking at some just individual verses and, and picking up a few things that we can learn from this chapter. Now that we've kind of gone over just the big overview of what's happened. In verse number 9 it says, And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him and delivered him out of all his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now, this, is, this goes in right with what I was just saying about uh, Stephen being martyred. Right? God is able to deliver us out of any of our afflictions. God is capable of doing it. Now, he may not always choose to do so, but we need to just put our faith in God that we know that he can, and we know that he will, as long as it is according to his will. And if he decides not to, to deliver you out of an affliction, don't get too discouraged about it. Just think, well, it must be God's will. There must be some reason why he wants me to go through this. And I'll tell you what, if you can have that type of an attitude, and if you can have that type of confidence going into those things, it's going to help you. It'll strengthen you to go through it. It won't be quite as hard as if you're thinking maybe God's forsaken. Because if God's not delivering you out of something, that might be a thought of thinking, well, why has God turned his back on me? When he's not necessarily turning his back on you at all, he just has a different purpose, a different, a different you know, goal in mind that you just don't see quite yet. And I mean, as long as you know you're doing what's right by God, I mean, everybody knows that individual in your own heart. Obviously, we're all sinners, but I mean, you know, if you're, I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're doing some wicked sins or something, and, and you're going through afflictions, okay, then I don't know. I mean, that's 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 between you and God on, on whether or not you're being punished for that, and that He's allowing you to go through that just because it's retribution for something that you've done. But if you know you're doing what's right, if you're doing everything, you know, as much as you can, living in God's, He's able to deliver you out of all afflictions. So don't be discouraged if for some reason you are allowed to go through them. Because those afflictions, those trials, you're going to come through them. You know, if, as long as you make it through them, you're going to come through way stronger and, and a lot better off. So um, let's look at another verse here. Look at verse number 19. It says, The same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil treated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live. Now this goes, I'm not going to get into this too much, but basically in the book of uh, Exodus, right, where Moses came out of Egypt, at the time, Pharaoh had made a decree. First, he made a decree that, that all the males, they were, just, they were supposed to be killed at birth, which shows you how wicked of a society they lived in. I mean, Pharaoh just made a decree and he said, look, as soon as any male children that's born among the Hebrews, just kill them. And that's what he told the midwives. Now, the midwives said they feared God more than Pharaoh. So they didn't listen to his command. They didn't kill the, the men children. 
And then they came up with an excuse to Pharaoh, because Pharaoh's like, uh, what's going on here? And they're just like, basically, that the Hebrew women, you know, that they're just having these kids before they could even get there and that they're born and, you know, there's nothing they can do about it. So then he make, makes a new law. He says, okay, um, the male children are just to be cast down the river so that they would die. Like, they're just, just you know, you have a male child, you know, no longer are the midwives supposed to just murder them. Now the parents are supposed to dispose of them. And, um, and that's just extremely wicked. And then you think, like, too, I mean, he's making this type of a law, and, it, and these guys wanted to go back to Egypt. I mean, Pharaoh's got them under that type of bondage, not just the physical, like, labor and the work, but, like, you have a male child, you have to put him to death. I mean, you got to send him down the river, and they wanted to go back to that? Unbelievable. And, and, and here's the verse that, that says in Exodus 122, it says, And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. And this is what happens to Moses. Um, you know, of course, you know the story where they, they end up putting him in, in the basket or whatever, and he floats down the river, and then Pharaoh's daughter sees him and takes him to be her own son. And then he learns all of the, the, all the wisdom of the Egyptians. It says in, in Acts 7.22, it says, And Moses was learned and all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and in deeds. Now Moses didn't exactly feel this way, but that's what the Bible reports. He was mighty in words and in deeds. Moses, when God called him, when God called him from the burning bush, and, and he wanted him to go forth and deliver the people, and he was saying his message, Moses didn't feel like he was mighty in words. But God promises him, in Exodus 3.18, he says, and they shall hearken to thy voice. So God's telling him, because he's given them this whole list, these things, I want you to do this, I want you to do this. And he says, they're going to listen to you. God tells them this. But Moses doubts God. In Exodus 4, 1, later on, and Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. Moses, why are you saying that? God just said that they're going to hearken to thy voice. He says, for they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. So Moses is just doubting and saying, look, they're not, they're not going to go for this. Even though God's telling him to do this. So, so God is long suffering, he's patient, he says, okay. God gives him some signs. And he tells him, you can, you can throw down your rod, it's going to turn into a snake, and you can pull out your hand, and it's going to be like leprous, right? Extremely diseased. And then you can heal it again, and it's going to be back to normal, right? So he's saying, that here's some signs that you can show him as well to just kind of prove that you're from me, from God. But then Moses still makes excuses. And in Exodus 4.10, he says, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. So Moses said, Look, I'm not a good speaker. I can't, I don't know how to speak in front of people. I'm not that good. And God's like, wait, who made the tongue? Like, you, you think that I can't handle these things? He's like, I make the blind and the deaf and the dumb. He's like, I made the tongue. And he says, now therefore go and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. He's saying, look, just go and do it. And here's the thing. A lot of people will use this as an excuse not to give the gospel, not to preach God's word, because they'll think, well, I'm not very good at talking. I'm not very good at talking to other people, especially strangers, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to talk to them. God will be with you. Look, Moses had the same problem. God promises, look, they're going to hearken to you. He's going to listen to you. I'm going to tell you what you should say. But Moses still, just, he's just backing up. He's like, I don't want to do it. And he, you know, I'm not a good speaker. Don't let this bring you down because look, God gets angry with Moses. Moses is really reluctant. He doesn't want to do this. And he comes up with all these excuses saying they're not going to listen to me, you know. And, and even after God says, here's some miracles you can do. Here's some, here's some things you can perform. Well, I'm, I'm just not a good speaker. I don't know what to say. And God said, look, I'm going to tell you what to say. You just go and do what I'm telling you to do. It says in uh, Exodus 4.13, and he said, Oh, my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Like, just send who you want to send, God. Basically, like, it's not me. Just don't send me. Like, send whoever you want to send, but not me. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, 
And I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. So he finally just lets him say, fine, Aaron can do the talking, but he's still using Moses to, do, to say it all. I mean, it's like, it's still Moses saying the words to tell Aaron to tell everyone else. And it's really too bad that, that Moses couldn't just, just go and do it. Now, obviously, Moses was an extremely great man of God, right? So here we see one flaw of Moses, you know, not trying to badmouth Moses. But look, we can learn from this. Don't have this type of an attitude. God can use, you know, with stammering lips, he can use you to, to get somebody saved because it's the power of God that's going to get them saved anyways. It's not your own power. It's not your own might. And it's not your own strength. It's not how good of a speaker you are. Look, I'm not a great speaker either. I'm not. I've, I've been, always been afraid of speaking in front of people. But I'm not going to let that stop me. I'd rather be used by God and just let Him get all the glory because even though I'm not a good speaker, even though I can't say things well, I still believe that God can use me. And God could use you too. God wants to use you. He's just waiting for you to, to allow yourself to be used by him. To open up your mouth. Don't have this Moses attitude and say, well, I'm not a good speaker. I can't do it. Yes, you can. God has given you the words to use. Open up the Bible and use the Bible to, to, to show people how they could be saved. <clears throat> Wrapping things up here, we have... Um, one more thing I want to point out, and then, and then I'm going to close, in verse 45. I don't know if you guys noticed this while we're reading, but you might have noticed this before. Acts 7.45 says, Which also our fathers that came after... This is talking about the tabernacle. So in verse 46, as we get the context, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles whom God drave out before the face of our God, our fathers unto the days of David. Now, a lot of people look at this and say, well, whoa, that's a misprint. I mean, Jesus wasn't there in the days of the tabernacle when, when they brought it into the land of Gentiles, so, you know, out of the wilderness. That was Joshua, right? Because Moses was not allowed to, to go into the promised land. Moses died right before they crossed the Jordan River to go into the promised land and to, and to go into the land of the Gentiles that was promised to them. And of course, when they did that, they brought the tabernacle with them. They brought the tabernacle of witness out of the wilderness into the promised land. So here it says, why does it say Jesus brought it in? Well, it's very simple. And it's, I, don't, I just don't want this to be a, a, a stumbling block for you or a point of confusion or for someone that tries to say, oh, look, there's errors in the Bible. Look, it even says that Jesus brought the tabernacle with us in. It's actually a very simple answer. Jesus and Joshua are the same exact name. It's that simple. Basically, one is translated out of the Greek and the other one's uh, translated out of the Hebrew. Right? So, like, in the Hebrew, you have Jesus, like Yeshua, it's Joshua, and in the Greek, it's, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, right? But it's the same exact name. So Jesus, whether it's in, you know, regardless of the language it's coming from, it's just a slight variation, but it's the same exact name. So when it says Jesus, it's because, you know, they're saying Joshua's name in Greek, and it's translated from Greek into English. So, again, and, you know, Joshua in the Old Testament, his name is Joshua, that's coming out of the Hebrew but um, in the Greek, it's translated as Jesus, but it's the same exact name. So don't let that be a, you know, a point of confusion or stumbling block for you. It's really, it's really not that big of a deal. Um, it's also interesting to know that and to remember that because you'll see that oftentimes, you know, in the New Testament especially, you'll see Isaiah and Elysius. And, you know, you're like, who are these people? Well, Elysius is just Elisha. Isaiah is Isaiah. You know, Isaiah, it's like... The, you can see it's just the, 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 the variations in the language, but it's the same name. Just like when I go um, Jesus Christ in Spanish, it's Jesus Cristo, right? Um, you know, there's, and, and you, could, you could come up with a lot of other examples of names that they're the exact same name, but when you say it in another language, it just sounds a little bit different. So don't let that be a point of confusion. 
wrapping things up here, you know, Stephen was a great man of God. I love this, this, you know, this, he was used of God mightily. And we see here the, this, this great sermon that he preached. And um, let's look to Stephen for an example. Um, he, he was a great man. He did, he did all kinds of things for God. He had a lot of boldness. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. And um, he didn't back down when he was confronted by the chief priests and the Pharisees, questioning him on his faith. He didn't deny the Lord. He, he stayed true unto death, I mean, unto the stoning. And I'm sure he's got all kinds of, of great rewards in heaven for, for making that type of stand. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the story that you've given us and, and for recording these words in the Bible that Stephen preached to the to the. Pharisees and the chief priests, dear God, for us to learn from today. Uh, there's so much packed into this chapter, dear God. It's such a long chapter, and I, and, um, I pray that you would please just help us to gain more truths and more understanding from the things that we didn't quite go over tonight. And um, I pray that you would please just give us the boldness and the strength to be able to stand up and preach your word, dear God. I pray that you would please help us not to have a the the attitude that Moses had of not wanting to go and preach your word because we don't feel like we're good we're good at speaking or good at talking to people dear Lord but just help us to have enough faith to, to let you use us even even though we don't have great talents in maybe in that area but that we can just rely on you to give us to, to see us through it and to use us um, and to really just use your words we don't even have to use our own words that much but just to use your words dear God to, um, to preach to people and, the, and to show them the truth and how much you love them and, and want them to be saved. And I pray that you would please just, just help this church to produce lots of soul winners and have a great impact on the area here. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.